our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Amen. You believe that? See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Yes. Come on, sing it. Good morning, everyone. Everybody having just a wonderful, rainy Sunday morning? Nice and cold and rainy, and what a day, amen? This is the day that the Lord has made. It, you know, the weather tends to have an effect on us, but here's the thing, it doesn't have an effect on Jesus. It doesn't have an effect on anything that he has done, anything that he has promised this morning. He is still worthy of our prayer. And so we want to give it to him. We want to celebrate all that he has done because he has done great things. Amen? And the greatest thing that he ever did was that Jesus left the throne in heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, and died on the cross in our place. The death that we should have died, he died, taking our sin upon himself so that we could have his righteousness placed upon us simply by believing and trusting in him. And we can stand secure in salvation forever, having hope today and forevermore, all because Jesus is good. Amen? 
And this morning we want to continue celebrating him, and we'd like to do so with a new song. You guys up for learning a new song this morning? I'm going to try that again. You guys up for learning a new song this morning? All right, all right, cool. All right. It didn't really matter. We were going to learn it anyway, but uh, it's this song is called Gone. And it's, uh, it's pretty simple. It's just celebrating what Jesus has done and saying that our chains are gone, our shame is gone, our sin is gone, that it is finished because he is risen and we have hope forevermore and we're just going to celebrate and sing hallelujah to him because of what he has done. I want to teach you the chorus real quick. It goes like this. Gone, gone, now my sin is dead and gone and I sing hallelujah. Done, done. He is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. Y'all got it? Good enough? All right, let's do this. Come on. You shed your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone I won't be shackled to the way I was Oh, I'm gonna live like my chains are gone
Bless my might to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands in his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sea by heavy stone messiah still and all around And we praise him because he is good and he is great and he is worthy of our praise. The King of kings and the Lord of lords and that same Jesus who conquered sin and death on our behalf. He stands with arms wide open. He says, I love you. I don't care about your past. I want to take your past. I want to redeem it. I want to give you my righteousness and give you a hope for now and forevermore. And so this morning, if you don't know him, just know you can call upon his name at any point, at any time, and say, Jesus, I give you my life. I ask you to save me, and he will do it.
Hey, I'm glad you're here uh, this morning, whether you swam in, waded in, or canoed in. I'm glad you made it here uh, this morning. And I invite you to take your Bibles and open up to the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 2. And we'll uh, look at that in just a minute. Um, and uh, hey, let me just remind you, too, that registration is now open and will continue for uh, the foreseeable future. Uh, for our trip to the Holy Land next December, December 29th through January 6th. There are brochures that tell all about it out in the, uh, uh, the Welcome Center. And it had kind of a funny thing happen. You know, last week I talked to you about uh, the invasion of Israel from the north, the next great war. And <laughs> I got home and my wife, she calls me preacher, and she said, Hey, preacher, you know that really wasn't a very good advertisement for a trip to Israel <laughs> when you preach. But we had folks sign up anyway. Hey, listen, it's very safe over there, and uh, frankly, if Jesus is going to come back, it'd be one of the places I'd want to be. Hello? He's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. So uh, at any rate, though, I hope you get to go with us and you can sign up. You know, I've been telling you, if you understand biblical prophecy or if you read biblical prophecy, uh, and then you start re watching the news or reading the newspaper, every week you can find something. Let me tell you what I came across uh, this week, a headline in an article that said, the Sanhedrin in Israel they still exist, by the way, gets authorization to use their trees for the third temple. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, the Bible says in the last days there will be a third temple. Herod's temple was the last temple on the Temple Mound. Now there sits a thing, and we'll see it. We'll go there, called the Dome of the Rock. It's a big golden uh, dome, and I, won't, I don't have time to really go into that today. But there will be a rebuilt temple there. That will come after uh, the Antichrist rises to power, and I think it will be an attempt to pacify and settle the Middle East under his leadership. But at any rate, uh, already there are uh, Jewish organizations in Israel that are preparing for the third temple, uh, even though right now they can't do it. They're already, and this is one of them about five years ago. Even the wood that is used in the sacrifices, the wood that's used in the altar that's burned there, had to be a sacred wood that was grown for that very purpose. And it was always inspected, make sure it had no worms or it had no defects in it. Everything that was used uh, in service to God in the temple had a sacred quality about it. And so the very trees that they used to cut down to stoke the fires and keep the fires that, were, that burned were kind of sacred trees. Well, five years ago, the Sanhedrin uh, began planting trees, and it takes at least five years before they are uh, at a stage where they qualify to be used uh, in the temple. There's no temple, but my point is already uh, things are happening there. They fully believe that there will be a third temple, and the Bible actually says that that will be the case. So I just remind you, just if you will, just look if you look every week, you'll find things. Say, hey, that, didn't the Bible talk about that? Doesn't the Bible have something to say about that? And in fact, it does. Now, last week we talked uh, about the prophesied global war that is coming. The next great war is what we called it. And it's not about uh, uh, will it happen. It is about when it will happen. It is going to happen. The Bible has told us that it is going to happen. And we looked at a lot of evidence. I'll give you some more here in just a bit, and you'll see how that relates to what I want to talk to you about this morning. But uh, we talked about that next great war. Now, here's what I want to talk to you about today, and that is I want to talk to you about the, the next world empire. Did you know there's a global empire coming? The Bible says that uh, it won't be many nations. All the nations will come under the authority of this uh, global empire, this global government. It'll be under the leadership of the Antichrist. I'm going to do some messages on the Antichrist down the road as, as well in this series but there is a one world government that is coming. The Bible is very clear. Our passage, as you will see, uh, we'll talk about that. We'll read that in just a bit. Uh, a name that some of you may know is the name Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger was our Secretary of State for uh, a number of years and has been uh, uh, considered one of the elite statesmen even after his tenure as Secretary of State of the United uh, States. He has been considered an elite uh, kind of statesman. He's spoken and used all over the world. And in 1991, he was speaking at the Bilderberg Conference in Evian, France, and, um, and this is what he said. Listen, uh, he said, today Americans would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Today, he said, this is 1991, Americans would be outraged if, if troops 
uh, moved into Los Angeles to restore order. And then he adds, but tomorrow they will be grateful, meaning Americans will be grateful for that sort of thing. And he says this is especially true if they were told that there was an uh, outside threat, uh, some threat from beyond, whether that threat was real or fabricated. That, and that threat seemed to threaten their existence. It is then that all the people of the world will plead with world leaders to deliver them from this evil. The one thing every man fears is the unknown. When presented, when presented with this kind of scenario, he says, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of a person's well-being granted to them by a world government. Now, Kissinger uh, has continually, since he served in the administration, he has uh, uh, consistently uh, and repeatedly pressed for the need for a one-world government. John Fontaine, uh, Fonte, a Hudson Institute fellow, wrote a book called Sovereignty and Submission. Not a believer, but just he wrote this book. In his observations, he said, and I quote, global government is simply a euphemism for a world government. Following World War II, globalists openly talked about creating a world government, but they experienced tremendous backlash, and so they changed their terminology from world government to global governance. Fonte goes on to say, what they call global governance is really the setting up of laws and rules and institutions which they consider superior to a nation's individual laws. He goes on to say, this is what has happened in the European Union. It is now the model for 10 proposed regional unions worldwide or the global union. The threat comes from the UN, from forces within the European Union, and within the American elite and their leading law schools who are trying to establish a global governance. By the way, it's interesting, I think, as I'll show you in a moment, that he mentions 10 regional unions. Because Revelation and Daniel both talk about that the last great kingdom before the eternal kingdom of, of God will be made up of 10 subregions, all under the leadership of the Antichrist. So ultimately, there'll be this 10 nation, uh, uh, this 10 region confederacy that will control everything from the economy to religion. I'm going to talk about those components in the next message, but it will affect national sovereignty. It will affect the destiny of many nations because they'll be consumed under this global, these regions, these global regions. And for some nations, it will result essentially in their death as an individual nation. But what will usher in this kind of global government? It is coming, as you'll see in our text today, but what, what might bring it to pass? Well, it could be one of several things. For example, it might be that great next great war that I talked about uh, last week. That could usher in this. Uh, most Americans don't spend much time thinking about a potential war with Russia. But over in Russia, they think a lot about a potential uh, coming war. The last time Americans really thought about uh, this was during the era we called the Cold War. Uh, many of you weren't alive in, in that era, and it was tense. But since that time, uh, most Americans really don't think much about it. And frankly, most of the generations below my generations don't think much about it. But in Russia, they are talking about uh, a war that will uh, be uh, uh, catastrophic. They have warned that there is a big war coming. If you didn't hear my message last week, uh, it would be perhaps worth your time to listen to that next great war. For example, uh, Valery uh, Gerizmov, uh, the chief of Vladimir Putin's general staff, has said, and I quote, he believes the West, that is Western European, that would be America, are preparing for a large-scale military conflict. He believes that's coming. This is the kind of thing that could set the stage. Michael Snyder has written this. He said, Iran continues to get cozy with Russia and China. In fact, the three nations during the last weekend of December, just this past December, listen, he said Russia, China, and Iran did something they'd never done before because they've been mortal enemies. You know what they did? They had their first ever joint naval drills. This is at the end of December, this past December. The, the first ever joint naval drills between those three nations in the Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Oman. As I indicated last week, the Russians have developed a very strong military presence in the Middle East with, with a major military port in Syria now. 
and uh, Russia and China have both warned about uh, what a war between the U.S. and Iran would mean for that region. In fact, some have said ultimately um, uh, one of the, the big reasons why President Trump may have not been more aggressive with Iran is because he realizes that it could potentially spark World War III. And the fact is, if we go to war with Iran, the Iranians have already made clear their strategy. Now listen to this. They've already made clear their strategy. Their strategy will be to launch missiles, not at us, but to launch their missiles directly at Israel. And Israel would undoubtedly strike back with overwhelming force. Israel's force will, is overwhelming compared to Iran. I told you last week, however, that may precipitate uh, Russia getting involved, the other Arab nations, coalition, maybe even China getting involved on some uh, level. Uh, Itan uh, Geboa, who is the director of the Center for International Communications uh, at Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv, he said this, uh, he laid out the, uh, the, the current state of affairs from Israel's perspective. And according to Gilboa, this director for this center at the university in Tel Aviv, he said, it is obvious for all kinds of reasons that Iran would not attack Israel directly from its own territory. Confrontation between Iran and Israel, however, is unavoidable. There is great probability for some Iranian military action. And this is something Israel is preparing for. Now, I tell you those things to say this. Uh, what would, what would uh, precipitate a one-world government? It is my opinion that that kind of scenario could be the very uh, appropriate trigger that sets the stage for a one-world government, i.e. under the leadership of the Antichrist. Um, think about this. Uh, the global chaos from that war, uh, the economic chaos that would result um, the people's desire, the nation's desire to have uh, everything kind of settled down. And, and by the way, it'll have long-term effects. It'll have effects not just in the Middle East. It will affect uh, all the nations of the world. And so the desire, somebody just settle this stuff and try to give us a life back and that kind of thing would, would set up, set the table well for a a leader who could rise up and say, I can do that. I can. And the people will be so hungry for that kind of, let's settle things down, that it is a, a, a likely scenario uh, for an antichrist, the antichrist to rise. Adrian Rogers, who's now dead, but Adrian Rogers said before he died years ago, he, he believes the antichrist is already alive. And I don't know that, but I think it's a possibility. I think it's a very good possibility. So something like this, that, that next great war, uh, which is a war that happens before the tribulation period, that next great war could usher in uh, a setting in which the world would say, please, if somebody can fix this. So that's one scenario. There are lots. Let me give you one other possibility. It may not, it, it could happen even uh, with or without that war, and that is economic, uh, an economic crash. Today, the economies of the world are linked. Uh, the internet has, has done that. I have a I have a section from my Wall Street Journal from last year. I kept it when I saw it. I didn't even know I was going to be preaching on this stuff. But it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's a whole section called The Shrinking of the Political Middle, and it's talking about globalization of the world and the economic uh, importance of shrinking the, the globe into kind of a global uni a unified globe in terms of at least for commerce and potentially even political uh, uh, operation. The whole article. By the way, there's another article in this, uh, this section. Listen to this. Remember I just talked to you about Russia? This was back in January of 2019. Russia's, it says, Russia's Mideast ambitions. And the article was talking about how Putin wants to move down into uh, uh, the areas that we're seeing him drop down into, their Middle East, to get some control there. These kinds of things uh, could precipitate a leader rising up because of the chaos that will result. And by the way, if our economy crashes, listen, if America, the American economy crashes, it dominoes the rest of the, the economies of the world because we are linked. And the standard for all world economies, you know what it is? It's the American dollar. That's why, did you know, Russia and China at, uh, I think it was one of the G8 summits several years ago, I've got the material in my files, uh, pleaded for the rest of the major nations to try to move us to a one-world currency. 
I'm going to talk about those things in economy and, and in religion, the one world, because we're going to have a one world economy at some point, obviously, if you've got a one world, but there'll also be a one world religion. We'll talk about that in the future. Uh, but uh, so the economies are linked. If the American economy goes down, it's going to domino other uh, countries. It's something like that could create global chaos, which would cause people to rise up and say, uh, we, need, we need somebody can, can settle all this, uh, settle the economies down. And so again, it, it could be a scenario like that. It could be something like, and I'll talk about this uh, uh, later in other messages, it could be something like, think of a, a tactical nuclear uh, bomb. Have you ever thought that if a tactical nuclear warhead went off in New York City, do you realize it renders that city completely useless, they tell us, for hundreds of years? And the globe's economy is still focused out of New York. And so, can you imagine if that happened? It could topple the economy, all right? Just one thing like that. I read that our deficit uh, this year has reached a trillion dollars. I read that yesterday morning in the Wall Street Journal, that our deficit is now a trillion dollars, and that our, now don't be confused, and that our debt, uh, national debt, is 23 times that. I mean, there are some economists who say, we, 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 I mean, we're going to go under. At some point in time, we can't keep accumulating this kind of debt, and boom, it, it will flip a, a switch. Some kind of global economic chaos could, could set the planet up for someone who has a plan and says, I can fix this, and here's how we've got to all come together, and people will be so craving that, they will say, whatever it takes. One European leader said several years ago, he said, if... Uh, if, if the devil himself showed up with a plan that could unite us, I would follow him. And I'm going to tell you, that's going to be the way it's going to, to feel at that juncture. Whether it's, yeah, it, what, look, whatever triggers it, uh, people are going to be ready, and it's going to set the, the table uh, for this uh, one world uh, leader. Um, our world is on a fast track right now to globalization and this one world government. It's sometimes referred to as a new world uh, order. And, uh, and for that reason, uh, our antennas need to be up. Um, and so with that in mind, I want to read to you our text. I'm not going to ask you to stand. It's a lengthy text, but I want you to follow along with me. If you've got your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 2, um, verse 31, I'm going to come back. I'm going to read the story uh, or the passage, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to give you context and, and tell you... Uh, specifically what's going on here. All right, Daniel is talking to King Nebuchadnezzar beginning in verse 31, and he said, you uh, saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you. I'm in verse 31, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, um, a stone was cut out by no human hand. That's an important verse. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became um, a great mountain and, was, and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom and power and might and, and the glory, and in, into whose hand he has given what, uh, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so um, the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven 
will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Father, would you take now this interpretation and would you cause it to resonate in our hearts and our minds? Father, if there are those in this building today who do not know you, I pray that you will use your Holy Spirit and your Holy Word to quicken their hearts to recognize what is ahead and how they can prepare and be ready for your return. Father, would you speak to us, adjust our lives anywhere and everywhere that they need adjusting through the message that you have for us today. Touch my lips, Lord. Let everything that I say be pleasing to you. Use it, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me give you some context now about this. Nebuchadnezzar is a pagan um, uh, emperor. He is head of Babylon. Babylon had conquered uh, uh, Israel. It was, it was divine judgment on Israel because of their rebellion against God. And so Babylon had taken them captive. There were some Hebrews, uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego among those, and they began as servants in the, in the uh, uh, kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. They were just servants. They were not uh, elevated at this point in time. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, this uh, pagan uh, emperor, he has a dream. And in this dream, he sees a statue or an image, and the image is a pretty magnificent image. It has a head of gold. It has a chest and arms that are of silver. Uh, it, it has an abdomen uh, of bronze and a uh, uh, stomach of bronze. Uh, and then it has two legs made of iron. And then when you get to the feet, you have a mixture. You have clay and iron mixed together. And by the way, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that's not a good combination. Iron and clay just don't mix very well. And so that's the image, and Nebuchadnezzar sees that. God is speaking, and he knows there's a message in this image, but he doesn't understand what it is. And so he calls in his, um, his magicians and his soothsayers, and he tells them he's paid them. They are paid part of his uh, royal staff, and their whole job is to come in and to interpret things or do uh, some kind of magic or make things happen, okay? And the devil has some limited powers there, by the way. And so he calls them together. He said, I have this dream. I can't rest. I, I, I can't sleep at, at night. I, I need to know what it means. By the way, uh, I heard about a pastor who uh, had one of his members call him one night and said, Pastor, I'm having trouble sleeping. Would you mind preaching to me for just a few minutes? I identify with another pastor who said, he's a, he said, I've always thought of myself as a really good pastor. And um, I identify with that. I've always thought of myself as a really good pastor and preacher because, because at the end of my message, there's always a great awakening. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, some of y'all get that at lunch, okay? But uh, at any rate, so Nebuchadnezzar says, I, I can't sleep. I, I, what's going on here with this message? And And so he says, and by the way, to his magicians and his, um, uh, you know, his uh, uh, astrologers and all these, he says, oh, by the way, here's a condition. I pay you to do this. And if you can't do this, um, I'm just going to kill you. Well, they go, they say, we need some time, king. And so they get it and they start trying to figure out what are we going to do? And they say, we don't know what this dream means. How are we going to explain it to him? And we're going to lose our life. They panic, but there's one among them said, but there's a guy, a servant here in Nebuchadnezzar's court named Daniel, and he has the ability to interpret dreams. And so they go get Daniel. They tell Daniel what's going on. And Daniel says, well, let me go spend some time with the Lord. Daniel goes and spends some time with the Lord, and he comes away from that time. God gives him a dream, and the dream is the interpretation of the king's dream. Are y'all with me? And so Daniel comes back and says, I've got it. The Lord has spoken to me. I know what the dream means. They're all relieved. And so they say, we got to get you before the king. Now, by the way, this prophecy, this prophecy was written 600 years before Jesus was even born. And it speaks about Jesus. Did you know that? I'll come to that at the end of the message. It speaks about Jesus. So 
So uh, Daniel goes before Nebuchadnezzar, and he, he says, I've got an interpretation for you. And that's what we just read, all right? The verses that we just read were Daniel standing before the king, and he said, here's a dream you had, and here's an interpretation uh, of uh, that dream. And so with that in mind, uh, I want to show you three things out of this uh, passage. It, it is a sweet prophecy of the coming and, uh, eternal kingdom of Christ, uh, but not before there is the first thing I want to show you, a historical application of this passage. And verses 31 to 35 give us this historical application. Uh, and you might say, now how does that fit in? You're talking about a one world, um, a, a new world order. How does that fit in? Well, he, uh, you, you need to stay with me through the whole message, okay, so you'll get it. But Daniel's identification of the composition of this image, right, all these different materials it's made of, uh, has signi uh, historical significance because it leads through all the kingdoms of history until the final kingdom ruled by the Antichrist and the ultimate kingdom that destroys all previous kingdoms, the kingdom uh, of Jesus Christ. So it connects eventually, but you have to understand the historical application. And so uh, when you think about this image uh, that it, Daniel describes, think about it as it represents all these uh, um, all these empires, all these kingdoms through the ages and uh, what happened to them. And, and so uh, he gives us their history and then we know from our history that what Daniel said happened precisely like Daniel said it. And so let's define uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. First of all, he talks about the Babylonian Empire. Daniel says the, first, the head of gold, uh, the Babylonian Empire equals gold. All right, verse 38, the head of gold is, um, is the Babylonian empire. All right, that's the first one. It, the Babylonian empire was strong, it was powerful, and it was wealthy. And so uh, for that reason, uh, Daniel says, that's you. I, it, so Daniel actually says, the first one is you. You are the first kingdom uh, that is mentioned and true to God's word, by the way, Jeremiah 25 predicted the destruction of Babylon within 70 years. Interesting, 70 years of captivity of Israel. And after that, God brought judgment upon Babylon. I wish I had time to explain and talk about that more. But uh, so God, uh, uh, Daniel says, you are the head of gold and you're wealthy, you're strong, uh, you have status. But Jeremiah 20, uh, 25 tells us that they would be destroyed within 70 years. They were exactly, and not only that, uh, Jeremiah says that it'll happen in one night, and it did. Uh, and that leads to the second kingdom, the one that conquered Babylon, Medo-Persian Empire, under the lead of Darius the Mede. And it is the empire of silver, the silver arms and the silver uh, chest. And uh, it symbolized uh, silver because silver is also strong, but it's, not, uh, it, it's stronger than gold. Gold is softer than silver. Silver uh, is um, stronger than gold, uh, but it is of less value. And uh, the Medo-Persians raised a mighty army. They were powerful in battle, but they lacked the kind of nobility and wealth that Babylon had, and they would last for 207 years. You know, I told you in um, an early message in this series, The Rise and Fall of Nations, that the average uh, lifespan of nations, empires, has been 250 years, and you see that played out in these as well. And uh, they were finally destroyed, the Medo-Persian, okay, so Babylon, then Medo-Persian conquers Babylon, okay? Then after that, you have the Greek Empire, which uh, uh, equals bronze. You see that, that C on your outline. This is the, the next kingdom, and the Greek Empire conquered the Medo-Persians under the leadership of Alexander the Great. His armies were powerful, they were, they were fast, and they moved through, and they conquered uh, Medo, the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. And they lasted from 331 B.C., to 63 B.C. 
uh, under Alexander's uh, leadership, and then after his death, under the leadership of his generals, uh, it was divided. The empire was divided into four sections, each general getting a section uh, to lead. But think about this. Uh, uh, Alexander died at the age of 33. And he said, history records that he sat on the banks of the Ganges River and he wept like a child and said before he died, there are no more worlds for me to conquer. He had conquered the then known world. Well, the Medo-Persian Empire had controlled the then known world. And prior to that, the Babylonian Empire controlled the then known world. These governments were all global. Does that make sense? And then so uh, following the Greek Empire, there's the Roman Empire and it is represented by iron. And notice it's symbolized by two strong legs of iron. And this, each empire, uh, uh, Daniel says, has crushed the previous empire. In other words, it's made nothing out of the empire uh, that came before it. It's that powerful. Uh, Rome was known for its strength. It's known for its armies. It was known for its government and its judicial system. In fact, Rome changed the world more than any previous empire had. It lasted for about 500 years, but it was so influ influential that even today, many of our government institutions, our bureaucracy, judicial codes, and languages in many cases are based on systems that were developed and used by the Romans. That's how influential they were. And just like the image portrayed here, Rome, listen to this. Let me show you how accurate the scripture is. Just like Daniel said, two legs, did you know the Roman Empire split into two parts? The Roman Empire split into two parts. And it, that happened under uh, Emperor Constantine. Uh, essentially, Constantine became a Christian. He had a vision. He, he was going into a battle that he was mismatched against, and, and at that time, uh, Rome had grown weak morally, by the way, a whole lot like America and they were to go into battle, and Constantine had a vision. And in the vision, he saw Jesus Christ and Christ leading his armies to victory, and he was converted to Christ. And not only was he, at that time, in the Roman Empire, the Christians were underground. Remember, they'd take them out if they called them and put them in the Colosseum, and they would martyr them and those sorts of things. We have the catacombs where they lived and where you can still see the remains of Christians who were martyred for the, the sake of the gospel. And, and so that's how Rome was until Constantine got converted. And he was converted because he had that vision and he actually went out under what he believed was the leadership, divine leadership against an army that was superior to his and won. And because of that, he said, Jesus and Christians are worshiping the real God. And he says, so now, he said, I declare the Roman Empire is a Christian empire and the churches can, can come alive and they can prosper and all of this sort of thing. And he had a wonderful evangelistic tactic he used. Here's what he would do, Jonathan. He, because he was a Christian, he would come and he would say, Jonathan, I want you to be a Christian because the empire is now Christian and everybody is going to be Christian in our empire. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to become a Christian. And if you don't, we'll just cut your head off. That's a great evangelism strategy, don't y'all think? And they had lots of converts, as you can imagine. Well, that's what he did. And so it set up a kind of a pseudo-Christian uh, empire for a while, but it would eventually fall itself. And so there, was the, there were the two parts of the Roman Empire. The western side was based in Rome, and the eastern side was based in what was called Constantinople. It was named after Constantine, which is today, modern-day Istanbul. Uh, we've been there. By the way, our church for several years had a partnership uh, uh, there in Turkey uh, where we were taking teams there to take the gospel. It was a little more friendly to the gospel than it is under Erdogan, who's now kind of turning them back toward Islamic rule. But at any rate, so, so that was the Roman Empire, and, and it was the last great empire that Daniel talks about. But the next empire that is coming, he said, will be made of iron and clay. What does he mean by that? We call it sometimes, it's sometimes referred to as the revived Roman Empire. There's a lot of speculation and debate among Bible teachers and Bible scholars uh, about will the next great empire be housed or based out of Rome? It's possible, but that may be as symbolic as anything just to simply say there will be an empire like Rome that will be powerful in its ability to control the entire globe. 
And uh, that'll be, of course, under the Antichrist that we're going to be talking about in uh, future messages. But it is, you might say, a fifth kingdom. It is a kingdom that is to come. And uh, it, will, it will form this ten uh, uh, region um, confederacy is what it will do. And the whole world will be subject uh, to the larger confederacy under the leadership of the Antichrist. Now, do you notice he said, did y'all follow along? Did you notice he said, but it, it, the feet are made of clay and iron, and they just don't mix. So this will be um, a, a, a tenuous kind of empire. This It'll only last for seven years, the Bible says. It'll be tenuous because it just doesn't, in other words, it'll happen, but there'll be a lot of people who aren't satisfied with this kind of union. In fact, the Bible tells us that there will be uh, uh, leaders of some of these, uh, these regions who will decide they can out a better way, and they'll just simply be taken down and, and killed for defying the leadership of the Antichrist. But, that's the, but, but it'll be wobbly at, at best. It'll be a, a, um, an empire by coercion uh, in many ways, and will certainly include uh, religion, which we'll talk about in a, another message. So, now, with that in mind, though, that defines the image, uh, the image, all right, you got it, in the historical context. Listen fast, okay? The second thing that I want you to see is the practical interpretation. We see that in verses 36 to 43, uh, where Daniel says, now, I'm going to just tell you w- what's going on here. He clearly explains to Nebuchadnezzar about the kingdoms that will follow Uh, his own kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, here's your kingdom. That's the first one in this image. And then here are the other kingdoms that will follow. That's just simply the practical and clear interpretation. But not everyone understood it. You know, the magicians and the astrologers of Nebuchadnezzar, they didn't get it. And you know why they didn't get it? Because they were fakes. They were phonies. They were frauds. So they had no connection really with God. Uh, and so they couldn't understand what was, what was going on. And I will tell you something, apart from uh, uh, God in our lives, this stuff can be very confusing and hard for us to understand and get. I thank God, I, I, I really, I don't know about you, but I, I thank God that he gave us an explanation, don't you? Uh, and, and, and it makes perfect sense when you read Daniel and you read history. All of these empires fell exactly the way uh, Daniel said they would. And I, I'm glad that God gave it, because if he had not have given it, I don't know that you or I could have ever figured out the, the, the prophetic message there. But here's an interesting question. And as I was preparing the message, and I was studying the passage again, uh, something occurred to me. Now, here I have Nebuchadnezzar. He, he has no connection with God. He, he will praise God before it's all over. But he has no real connection with God. But God gives him the... The, why, why didn't God just give it to Daniel or somebody? Why did he give it to the king? Well, it's a good question. I, I started thinking, and, and so, okay, maybe he just gives him his part. You know, Daniel, I want you to, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to just let you dream about your kingdom and see what's going to happen with your king. Okay, I can understand that. But why does he give him all the future kingdoms? And I began to think, why did God do that? Why did he, Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, certainly, if you want to talk about the future, couldn't you give it to somebody else? And, and, and as I began to think through that, I began to think, I I think the answer is threefold. Why did God give it to Nebuchadnezzar? Number one, he did because he wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know who the real king of kings was. He wanted him to know, and he wanted him to get a glimpse of of what God would do. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was arrogant. He would erect an image, even after this, in which he would tell people, you got to worship me. And, uh, uh, And so God wanted to show him, I firmly believe, uh, who is the most powerful. His his magicians, his astrologers, they couldn't explain it, but God's messenger could. And he wanted to show Nebuchadnezzar who's really in charge. And after, by the way, Daniel explains this to him, Nebuchadnezzar does praise God. He said, you're God. He said, we're not giving up our gods, but I just want to say this, of all the gods, your God is the God. He wins the God battle. That's essentially what Nebuchadnezzar said. We're not going to give ours up but your God is, there, there's no doubt uh, about it. So God wanted to show Nebuchadnezzar who he really was. Number two, I believe he gave him that because God wanted Daniel to be promoted. We didn't read this, but in verses 48 and 49, we see that after Daniel interpreted the dream, Nebuchadnezzar said, you need to be in a position of greater leadership. 
And so you know what? He promoted him to the equivalent of what we might call the prime minister of the nation. This is a guy just serving in the court. And suddenly he is elevated. But not only is Daniel elevated, Daniel says, I have some friends. And they're, you know, they have a connection with God just like I do. And I'd like to bring them in, into leadership here in the kingdom. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were elevated from just serving in the court to serving in the government, an influential place that God gave them. Listen, here's what I want you to get. Remember that God is always in control. He is in control even in environments that you think God can no way penetrate this. But he did. He penetrated the, the, the evil Babylonian empire and put servants in the right place uh, for the right time. God can use anything, including pagans and anyone, to accomplish his purpose and exalt his name. So God wanted Daniel to be promoted and to, to be put into a place of influence. And then third, I, I would say this, that God, listen, this is the very important one. This is the practical for us. God wanted us to know all of these things so that we could anticipate his return. So why did he tell Nebuchadnezzar this? Because he knew something. God knew that through the generations there would be people. And there would be a group of people on a Sunday morning at Ridgecrest. And they would read this story and they could look back and say, look what God did. God did exactly what he said he would do. All through history, God did what he said he would do. And so I really believe the reason he gave it to, to Nebuchadnezzar was so that Daniel could interpret it, Daniel could record it, and you and I, here we are, thousands of years later, sitting here and saying, oh, I get it now. But if we didn't have all the other empires, we wouldn't, know, we wouldn't be able to look back at history and say, well, God said it would happen this way, and God said it would happen this way. God said the Medo-Persians would conquer the Babylonians, and the Greeks would conquer the Medo-Persians, and I, uh, Rome would conquer uh, the Greeks. But now you and I have the privilege of saying, wow, it happened just like God said it would happen. Folks, that's an incredible thought. That's why this is an, a very powerful prophecy. And, and because of that, we can say, if God, if God said, it, this is the way it's going to happen to Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the coming, the only empire that hasn't come is the one of iron and clay. And so God got it right on those others. You think he's got it right on the next one? You better believe it. Which means we got to, not only do we have a theological basis, we have a historical basis to prove that God, what God says, God does. So I believe that's the reason that he gave that prophecy, so that we could be ready for the return of Christ. And that moves me to the last thing that I want to show you this morning. And that is, I want you to see the prophetic implication of this. Verses 44, 45 are some of the sweetest verses in Old Testament prophecy. Um, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all of these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand, look at this, forever. And then verse 45. You say, where is Jesus in all this? Verse 45, watch this. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this, in other words, after his kingdom, and the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. What are the prophetic implications? Well, there are the kingdoms of men in history and there is the kingdom of God. Uh, and that kingdom will ultimately be the final kingdom. Uh, so we've had, the, we've had uh, you know, the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron. We await the anti-Christian uh, empire, the feet of bronze and clay. By the way, with ten toes, hello? Ten horns are talked about in Revelation. Ten horns are talked about in Daniel chapter 7. These, this uh, ten nation, okay, that's the one that will come. That will be this, this one world government that will affect everything from religion and economy and, and social order. It will all be a part of that. 
And so, so we have these four that have happened historically. We have the fifth, the, the clay and the, the iron that is to come. And then there's the sixth kingdom, and that is the eternal kingdom. One day, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what are these implications? Well, uh, A, on your outline, first of all, we need to talk about a one world government's dominion. One world government dominion. The iron and clay kingdom is, is until the kingdom of Christ, it's the last one. It is the one that will we perhaps, or, or maybe at least if not us, the next generations will one day experience. And let me show you something about all of these kingdoms that are represented in this image, in this dream. All of those kingdoms, every one of them, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, the Greek, the Roman, Every one of them were global empires. They weren't national. They weren't regional. They controlled the world. This last one, the fifth one, iron and clay, will be global as well. It will rule the world, uh, and it will have authority over all the regions of the world. That's the way. The, in fact, let's look at, uh, turn it to Daniel 7. Show you something. A description, a bit of a description under the leadership of the Antichrist, uh, beginning in verse 23, it says, Thus he, he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. And look, listen, it says, It shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it to pieces. As for the, here, here we go, the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down, the, uh, put down three of those kings. Remember, if you, don't, if you don't comply with him, he'll just, he's going to get rid of them. There will be three kings. There will be, uh, that'll be, uh, uh, scholars say, and I agree, uh, they'll just be destroyed. And he tells us that this kingdom, and by the way, he says, but he calls it a fourth kingdom. You called it a fifth kingdom. No, that's why we refer to it sometimes as the revived Roman Empire. In the prophecy, they're just seeing it as, as the Roman Empire again, reborn in a different form or different fashion. All right, that's why it's a connection, remember, clay and iron. And so, but he says it's going to be a devastating, it, it will put down anything or anyone who tries to challenge it. It will destroy all other kingdoms. Um, Britt Gillette, a prophecy writer, said this, I believe we're on the threshold of a global government right now. The, uh, the global empire prophesied in the Bible will be a reality in our expected lifetime, he says. Paul McGuire, a journalist uh, and prophecy student, says one of the primary instruments for bringing the new global order is the United Nations and its climate change treaties like Agenda 21 and sustainable development. He goes on to say that none of these terms like eco-friendly climate change, Agenda 21, sustainable development, social justice, and similar phrases actually mean what they pretend to mean or what the mess masses of people think they mean. He says, in a manner of George Orwell's 1984, these are merely controlling words that conceal the UN's agenda uh, referred to as the plan. He also writes this. He says, um, uh, America and the world are on a fast track to a one world government. We're literally just one crisis away from that happening. It could happen overnight. I don't think most people realize that, he says. Do you understand? He said we need to be careful about some of the stuff we're hearing coming out of, of uh, the UN. It is a part, of, and, and uh, I don't have time to go into some of those agendas, but Agenda 21, Sustainable Development, they're using code words. And by the way, one of the uh, many uh, uh, scholars believe that one of the terms that they're using about uh, climate change and sustainable development and Agenda 21 is a front to use to say, hey, we, we got, a, we got uh, issues on the globe that we've all got to unite under, and that it is a front to try to bring everybody and say, yeah, we all got to work on that together and then eventually move toward this uh, kind of one global governmental thing. I don't know if it'll be the UN. 
Uh, but uh, at least that's what some are, are saying about that. Leo uh, uh, Holman, who is an uh, editor, editor for WND, wrote this. He said, the only thing the elite are lacking right now to fully create a new global order is a crisis big enough to garner public support in America and, uh, and other nations for full-on global governance. Did you get what he was saying? I, I told you earlier, I said it could happen overnight. But what he's saying is we're on the threshold, and he says all it takes is one, one crisis big enough to cause everybody to say, hey, we got to have a solution. And remember what Henry Kissinger said years ago. He said, if need be, we might have to fabricate a crisis, a global crisis, in order to create a kind of unifying effect. The quest for a new world order or a one-world government uh, has been in motion, listen, for decades, and many believe uh, even a couple of hundred years. Uh, and it's been in motion behind the scenes uh, by many leaders for a long, long time. Some of you in this room, not a lot of you, but some of you in this room are familiar with the, the name Walter Cronkite. If you're familiar with that name, hold, hold your hand up. Okay, a lot of you, Walter Cronkite. He was a, a, a newsman. At one point in time, he was designated as the most trusted man in America. I remember as a kid that my dad watched Walter Cronkite. And I remember him watching him as I got older and, and older as well. My dad watched two news sources, about the only two at the time, Huntley and Brinkley. Anybody remember that, too, that duo? Huntley and Brinkley and Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was considered the most trusted guy in media and in news in particular. What a lot of people don't know is that Walter Cronkite was an extreme leftist. And listen, he was awarded uh, uh, an honor uh, from the U.N., uh, the Norman Cousins Award for Global Governance. And uh, he told, when he received that award, these were his words. He told the, the, those people who were assembled there uh, that the first step toward achieving uh, the goal of global governance, which he then claimed is his, his personal dream for the world, that we would fall under one world government. And, and, and for that to happen, he said, the United Nations has to be strengthened. Walter Cronkite. A lot of people don't know that about him, that he was an extreme left, and has made comments in the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, that affirm uh, even this. David Rockefeller, you may not know that name, but you, I bet you know the Rockefeller name. Extreme wealth historically. In, uh, through, David Rockefeller is the founder of a group known as the Trilateral Commission. He founded that with his money. And in, in a quote, he said this, some people believe that we are part of a secret cabal working to build a, a more integrated global political and economic structure, a one-world government. He said some people actually believe we're involved in this conspiracy to create a one-world government. And then he adds, he said, can you believe that? And then he says, well, if you will, uh, that is a charge I stand guilty of and I'm proud of it. Wow. He said some people accuse us of that. He said, the facts are, it's true, and I'm proud of that. Pope Francis in 2015 said, and I quote, to manage the global economy, to bring about integral and timely disarmament, to guarantee the protection of the environment, and to regulate migration. For all of this, there is the urgent need of a true world political authority. Former President Jimmy Carter campaigned with the statement, we must replace balance of power politics with world order politics. Former President George H.W. Bush uh, in the 1980s began promoting the ideology on television that the time is now right to create a new world order. Former President George W. Bush in his second inaugural address said, when our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. Former President Barack Obama in 2015 signed a UN document related to world socialist, uh, to a world socialist state happening by 2030. And by the way, the document is nothing more than a template for global government. 
I've already mentioned people like Henry Kissinger. I told somebody in between the services, they said, Pastor, I was shocked when I heard the name Henry Kissinger. This has been a lifelong political ambition for him and, and others. I said, I could have spent the whole sermon giving you name and name and name and name of, of people that might surprise you who are interested in forming a global government. The stage is set. That's what I'm trying to say. The stage is set. The world's moving exactly the way God said. You believe that? I do. I, I believe that. Dr. Vance Havner um, and a man were sitting together one time. Dr. Vance Havner, a great uh, preacher, and he said, this man said to Dr. Havner, you know, and Dr. Havner had been talking about these things, and he said to Dr. Havner, he said, you know, uh, it's amazing. If someone were to write a book about these things, no one would believe it. It's just so incredible. And Dr. Abner looked back at him and said, somebody did write a book, and these things are in it, and still nobody believes it. Well, it's right there. It's in God's Word. But here's the good news, and this is what I want to close with. There's also the one world government's destruction. Now, stay with me. Remember verses 44 and 45, verses 34? Talk about a stone that was cut by no human hand, and it, it struck the image on its feet of iron clay and it broke it into pieces. The stone is the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what, here's what Daniel's interpretation was saying, that his return will crush all the kingdoms of man, everything that has been established by man. And did you know it said, notice it's a stone that was not cut with a human hand? Now, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, all these kingdoms we've just talked about, all of these kingdoms were man-made. They were man-formed for good or bad, but the, the kingdom of God is not a man-made kingdom. It is the God-created kingdom, and it's going to crush uh, the, all the history of the kingdoms of man, and it's going to replace them with his eternal kingdom. You might call it the sixth and final kingdom, and no kingdom has ever compared to it or ever will compare to it, because this stone, Jesus Christ, will destroy all ideas about what the kingdom should look like and act like and be like. In Matthew chapter 21, listen to what Jesus said. He said, have you never read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. It's not man's doing. He said, this is what God has done. And then he says, listen, he adds, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when this stone falls on anyone else, it will crush him. That's exactly 600 years before Jesus was born. That's what Daniel said, that there is a kingdom coming and it's going to crush all the other kingdoms. In fact, uh, in verses 34 and following, it says that this, this stone, Jesus Christ, will grind, it. literally, the idea is grinding to powder all the kingdoms that have ever come before it. And then, like on a threshing floor where chaff is, that the wind just blows away any, any remembrance of it. That's what the kingdom is going to be. And I want to tell you something, that's the kingdom I want to be in. Amen? Don't you? Christ is a stone. Christ is coming back, and I want to say this to you. His return will be characterized in four ways. Number one, it will be supernatural. His return is a supernatural return. It will be uh, supernatural. Verse 34 and, and 44 and 45 remind us that this is the work of God and not the work uh, of man. I'll tell you something else. It will be suddenly. If you notice in, in the passage, the word struck is used in this passage. Verse 35, look at that. Then the iron of the clay, no, it goes on down, and it says it will be struck. Your translation may have a different word, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain. You know what it is? It destroyed all the other past kingdoms, and it became the kingdom of all kingdoms. That's what it means, it became a mountain. And it struck, and here's what that word struck alludes to, suddenness. The return of Jesus Christ is going to be sudden. And it's going to un undermine uh, uh, or it's going to conquer all the old kingdoms of humanity. Anything you put your trust in, it doesn't matter. All of those things are passing away. But Jesus Christ is going to return suddenly. That's what he says. It's going to happen suddenly, quickly. 
struck. That's the idea there, that, it, that this stone falls out of heaven and it crushes all the other kingdoms. Suddenly, the Bible says he's going to come like a thief in the night. When you don't expect it, the stone is going to come and do away with all the kingdoms of humanity to set up the kingdom of God. And third, it will be supremely. His coming will be uh, supremely. Verse 44, he will set up this new kingdom and he alone will reign in that kingdom. You know, he died on this earth in shame, didn't he? The king of kings died on a cross in shame, naked, hanging there, dying for us. In this world, that's how he, he died. But the Bible says when he comes back, look what he, did you see it, 44? He's coming back as the reigning, ruling king. He, he died uh, half naked on a cross, but when he returns he'll, uh, returns, he'll be wearing a royal robe. He's becoming so different. If you know anything about history, you know the terms D-Day. You familiar with that term, D-Day? It's about the invasion, the military invasion. Uh, Normandy, France, up until a few years ago, we still had men that had, had been in the battle of D-Day in this church. I think they've all gone to heaven now. But they were in that battle, D-Day. But we lost a lot, a lot of, uh, of soldiers. But we broke the enemy's back. History tells us that D-Day broke the enemy's back. It was one of the major turning points in the war, D-Day was. It broke the enemy's back. But you know, after D-Day, there was another day. Did you know this? We celebrated another day. Did you know it was called V-Day? Can you figure out what V-Day stands for? Victory. Victory Day. Because the enemy's back had been broken, there was victory and there was celebration. By the way, there was celebration in the street in Europe. There was celebration in the street in America. Victory Day. I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died on that cross. That was D-Day. He broke the enemy's back on the cross. I mean, he broke our great enemy's back on the cross. That was D-Day. But you know what this is talking about? This is talking about V-Day. Jesus Christ, the victor, is going to return. V-Day. The D-Day will be done. The V-Day will be the time to celebrate the eternal kingdom that he has set up. And then last, it will be surely. He said at the end of verse 45, this dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. The return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his eternal, eternal kingdom is as sure as the sun rises and sets. It's not a something that might happen. It's something that's going to happen. And history proves it. He said all about all these kingdoms, and it, and it happened exactly like uh, history shows it happened. It, it happened. History proves it. And Jesus promised it. And if he's proved it there, what he said about his return, you can go to the bank on close by telling you a story. In 1938, um, on October the 30th, Orson Welles stood on a podium at CBS Radio Studios, and he, um, he, he directed 10 actors and a 27-piece orchestra for CBS's weekly program called the Mercury Theater on the Air. And, uh, but there were a lot of listeners that night who were late to the broadcast. And so they didn't hear a disclaimer at the very beginning. And when they picked up and turned on their radios, all they heard was a description of America under attack. And not only were we under attack, the story was that we were under attack from space aliens. And... Um, and whales put fright into much of the eastern seaboard as they were listening to this story. Um, by the way, they had an intermission in it, and even in the intermission, uh, they again made the disclaimer that this is a dramatization, this isn't really going on. But by that time, people were so worked up, they didn't even listen or hear the, the disclaimer. And um, they besieged police departments. Um, Newspapers were receiving calls, and CBS itself was overrun with phone calls 
about what's going on about this invasion. In New Jersey, in the dramatization, New Jersey was ground zero for this alien attack. And as Orson Welles is describing this alien attack, uh, people in New Jersey began to call, like National Guard guardsmen, began to call and ask where they are to report in order to get ready for this battle with these, uh, these aliens. The Trenton Police Department in Trenton, New Jersey, fielded 2,000 calls in under uh, two, uh, two hours. And as far away as Providence, Rhode Island, historic, uh, hysterical callers uh, were begging, listen to this, the electric company in Providence to cut power to the city so that the aliens couldn't see their city at night. It created a panic. By the way, later on, there were, there were uh, lawsuits uh, to CBS because of this and because of, uh, of the trauma that it enacted. Nothing became of those. But I was thinking about that story again this week as I was working on this message, and I thought, you know what Daniel tells us? That there is something coming from the sky. It's not space aliens. It's Jesus Christ. In fact, the angel said this to the followers of Christ as they stood on the Mount of Olives. Men of Jerusalem, why do you stand staring up into the sky? This same Jesus that was taken up from you will return again in like manner. Folks, why, does, why did God give us this? He gave it to us so we could be ready. There is something or I should say someone that's coming from the sky. Jesus Christ is going to return. And that's why it's important for us to look and see the season, to see what's happening, and understand. So when things do happen, we say, but I'm ready. Because I was warned in advance. Well, today we've been talking about uh, uh, a final one-world empire. It'll be uh, led by the Antichrist, the ultimate expression of evil, but it'll be short-term because the good news is that Christ will return and He will destroy all the kingdoms that have ever existed of man and set up His eternal kingdom. But you can start your citizenship in that kingdom today by receiving Jesus Christ as your uh, Savior and as your Master. You can do that right where you are. You can call on Him. You can say something like this from your heart, Lord Jesus, uh, I thank You that You love me and you died on the cross for my sin. I know that I'm a sinner, and I know I need you. And so today, right now, in this moment, I call on you. I invite you to come into my life and be my Savior and forgive me of my sins. Now, I can tell you, based on the authority of God's Word, that if you'll call on Him in that manner, He will hear that prayer, and He'll begin this wonderful transformation process coming into your life, making you a citizen of the kingdom of God, and helping you live the new life that only He can produce in you. And then we'd love to help you with that decision. On the screen in front of you, you'll see contact information. Would you let us know about your decision to follow Christ today? We'd like to send you some material. It's free. Uh, there are no strings attached. It's just growth material to get you moving in the right direction. And we want to help you do that as a result of your uh, new relationship with Christ. And then, of course, to all of those who are watching, I want to invite you to come and visit with us here at Ridgecrest on Sunday morning. If you do not already have a church home, we'd love for Ridgecrest to be that church home. We have two services on Sunday morning. We have an 815. We call it a blended style worship. It has choir and orchestra, praise and hymns, uh, and that may be to your stylistic liking. Or then we have a 1050 uh, contemporary service. It's uh, band-driven, it's very casual and relaxed, and that may be more to your stylistic liking. In either case, I'm going to bring the same message from God's Word, and we'd love to have you in either of those services if you don't already have a place to worship the Lord Jesus. Come and visit with us here at Ridgecrest. And then visit our website, www.rbcdothan.org. Uh, there you'll find a lot of information about who we are, 
uh, the ministries that are going on here. You can connect with us for live stream there, podcasting, video on demand of messages, including messages, all the messages in this series that we're currently in. So let me invite you to check us out uh, on the web. And then like us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have presence on all of those, and we'd love for you to be uh, one of our followers there. We do keep them uh, updated and uh, filled with information about what's going on here. And so I think they'll be helpful to you, and we'd love for you to follow us on those sites as well. Well, I hope you've been encouraged by God's Word uh, today. It's been my joy to share it with you. And I look forward to doing the same thing next week on this channel at this time. And I hope that you'll tune in once again. But until then, may the Lord's blessing be upon you.